Hello and welcome to Friday. We've been asked time and time again over the years uh, exactly how we record our Let's Plays. What equipment do we use? How do we hook it up? Uh, what is the process? And we had a video on the channel many, many years ago uh, that kind of outlined it, but it's dated and things have changed. So, today, I'm going to tell you our Let's Play setup. Um, how we record Let's Plays for YouTube for Stephen Plays. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over all of the equipment that we use, I'm going to go over how it's hooked up, and I'm going to put uh, links to all of the stuff that makes this work in the description down below. Um, so if you're interested in buying any of the stuff, you can use the links in the description. And you should, because we're Amazon affiliates and we get a kickback from it and it helps us. So if you want to use the same stuff, the links are down there. Of course, if you can find it cheaper, then, then do that, <laughs> because that makes more sense. Um, so the first thing uh, that you're going to need is a capture device. Uh, we have several and have used several over the years, but at this point we're using basically one, and it's this thing. This is the Elgato HD60. There's several different versions of this. Uh, there's the HD60S, which is basically a USB 3.0 version of this. Uh, there's also HD60 Pro, I think it's called, and it's an internal PCI card. This one works just fine. Um, Elgato is a company that came along a few years ago and they've been designing these capture devices and they are fantastic. They're affordable, they're simple to use, and they produce really great, um, really get great picture quality um, with very little uh, data. Like the, the file sizes are actually very, very small. They, they came up with their own H.264 compression thing that allows it to work reliably on a USB 2 connection but also still look really, really great. So uh, we use the HD60 for most everything. Um, the problem is that only will support HDMI. So if you want to record anything retro, you're going to need a different device. You're going to want, honestly, this thing. Uh, this is the slightly different model. This is the Elgato Game Capture HD. And uh, I know it has very similar names because they're terrible at naming products. Um, but the Game Capture HD will record retro connections. It'll record component, composite, S video, uh, and really it'll it'll actually record HDMI as well. The main difference between this device and that device is that that device is the only device of the two that can record 1080p 60. So if you want to record 1080p at 60 frames a second, you have to use that device. This one will do 720p at 60, and it'll do 1080p at 30. And it, but it won't do 1080p 60. So my advice when people ask me, what capture card should I buy? I'm only gonna buy one. If you're only doing new stuff, if you're only doing either PC games or the latest stuff, the Switch, the Wii U, PS4, Xbox One, whatever, if you're only doing that, then get the HD60, because you're only using HDMI anyway. If you're doing a lot of stuff, then you should get this, because there's not a lot of games these days that are even, at least on consoles, that are even running at 60 frames a second. So being able to record 1080-30 on HDMI is fine. Um, and it'll also let you do retro systems. You'll be able to hook up composite connections to this, which is the red, yellow, white, and record games like this. So if you have a wide variety of stuff that you're doing, Game Capture HD. If you're doing mostly new stuff, HD60. If you want both, then, <laughs> then get both. We have both and um, we, we generally just use the HD60, but we have both in case we need to do something old. Um, so that's one aspect of it. The other thing is microphone. Um, I, for many, many years, actually used uh, these. Um, and if you're looking for something that is budget, then this, this will fit the bill. This is a Sennheiser PC-151 headset. They're very inexpensive. They sound good. Um, the first few years of Steven Plays were recorded with these. And um, if, you're, if you're on a budget, these work pretty well. The downside to these is that, well, for one, there's better options, but um, also they use a three and a half millimeter jack instead of USB. And if you can, you want to try and separate yourself from that. Uh, USB or any sort of digital connection is, is just better than an analog connection like the three and a half millimeter. But if you're on a budget, these actually work really great. And now we use them as headphones. Well, they still have a function. 
Um, if you're willing to uh, spend a little bit more, the mics that we're using these days are the uh, the Audio Technica AT. 2020s. They're still relatively inexpensive. I think the mics are about a hundred dollars um, and uh, you just need the mic, uh, the cable, some sort of stand. Um, you could get a, a mic stand like we have and I'll put this in the description or you could get like a desk. There's things that like clamp onto the desk that hold the mic. You also probably want a shock mount whether it's connected to one of these or one of the arms just because it helps uh, helps prevent any sort of sounds from the desk shaking or the ground shaking or anything like that. And then a pop filter. This was like five bucks, something like that. It was pretty cheap, once again, in the description. Um, now, if you go this route, uh, what you're going to need is something called an audio interface. And it's the thing that allows you to take this mic that has an XLR connection and turn it into a digital format that your computer can understand. And I use uh, Focusrite Scarlett. There are many different brands out there. There's even many different uh, styles within uh, the Focusrite Scarlett set. Uh, but this is the one I use. The reason I have such a big one is because I wanted four mic preamps. This allows me to do uh, you know, a four player let's play and keep everyone on a separate track. And that's useful because if everyone's on a separate track, you can adjust everyone's audio independently, which is good. Because if someone's really loud and someone's really soft, then you can change it in post so they sound like they're at the same level. Now, um, this one is the 18i8 uh, because it has 18 uh, inputs and 8 outputs. I know it doesn't look like it, but there's some are, some are physical and some are digital. And um, this has served me really well. But if you don't need to record four people at once, which most people don't, uh, there are smaller models of this available. Um, so I'll put this in the description, but also some of the different models. Um, for example, Dan has one that's basically half the size. It's got two mic preamps and some of the other stuff that you may be interested in on the back. Um, but this is really great. You just hook up your mic right to the front. Um, I have pretty much always kept the input right at 50%, and keeping it at 50% has worked really well for for our purposes. Um, if you If you turn it up a little higher, you can start hearing people breathe in the other room. Uh, and obviously if it's too low, it's not gonna pick you up really well. So um, I've played around with it a bit and keeping it right in the middle uh, seems to work well for me. Uh, you can hook up a pair of headphones over here so you can actually hear what's coming through this device. And that's actually where this starts to shine a little bit because you can hook up all of your inputs here. And then when you put it on, when you put on your headphones, you can hear whatever's coming through this box. So you can hear yourself, which is, uh, which can be very useful if you were going to use it for something like singing or something like that. So you had some monitor. Um, it can be useful because you can hear the other people who are recording with you. And here is where I think it's most valuable. Whenever you do a Let's Play, you have to find some way of syncing the microphone, your voice, your, your commentary, to the game's audio. Because whenever you use a, a device like this, what's happening is it's recording the game's visuals, the video, and the game's audio. Uh, so you've got the game video and audio coming through from this device. But you're recording your audio through here. So then you have a question of how are we going to sync this? Because there has to be some way of making sure that things are all lined up. Now if you're on a budget and you're using some other hardware, or maybe you're just using you know these and you don't have a way of doing it a fancy way, um, one way is to just go through a menu when you're playing the game and make a noise with your mouth. Like back in the day, I would go up and down the menu screen of a game and say tick 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 and then I could sync that in post so I knew whenever I was going tick 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 that that was me going up and down the menus. That worked really well. But if you can, this works really really uh, a million times better because on the back of the focus right is uh, a few various other inputs and some of them are these line level inputs. Um, now you've got inputs one, two, three, and four for the mic but then back here is inputs five and six. So what I've done is I've got these uh, big quarter inch jacks hooked up that uh, are feeding into a three and a half millimeter jack. So quarter inch here for the left channel, quarter inch here for the right channel. And that is feeding into um, the back of my monitor, AKA this thing. 
Now this is going into the back of my monitor because I tend to record most of my stuff on the monitor, as long as it's just me. For example, if I'm doing a single player game, I, I play it myself in my chair. But you can plug this into the back of the TV as well. Um, both the TV and the monitor have a headphone jack, which is where audio comes out of. So what I'm doing is the, uh, the picture and the audio from this device are going to the monitor, and instead of coming out any sort of speakers, I'm instead rerouting it to the interface. And this is important, because what this allows me to do is whenever I go onto my program to record my commentary, I can record not just my commentary, but also the video game's audio. And then it's perfectly in sync. If you do it this way, your commentary will always 100% be perfectly in sync. You don't have to worry about anything, you don't have to do tick, 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 or any sort of other crazy thing, it's just always perfect. So once again, if you are if you have a TV, you would just plug this into the TV. For me, it's this monitor, and then I'm good to go, and things are good. So um, as far as how this is working, my audio comes through the microphone into the interface. It has a USB cable, and that is running to my Mac. Now I generally record my stuff with two different computers. You can obviously do this with just one. The reason I do two is because it it kind of halves the load. Um, the Windows computer is what records the video game visual and audio, and then the Mac is what's recording my um, my personal audio, my commentary. Uh, now as far as how the, uh, the HD60 works, it's pretty simple. Um, this is what's running to the computer. This is both its power and the data. It's just a USB cable. And then you have the input from whatever you're trying to record on one end. This is the HDMI cable that's going to the Xbox One. And then this uh, just passes through to whatever you want to watch it on. You would plug this into your TV, or in my case, a monitor. So, video game comes from the Xbox One, goes to this box. The data of all of that information is sent to the Windows computer, both to that and passes through this cable, and it comes out my monitor. So when we turn on the Xbox One, you can see that it shows up on the screen. And all that's happening right now is that it's passing through to the uh, to the monitor. Now if I open up the capture software, and this is included when you buy one of the Elgato products, uh, when I open up the capture software you're going to see the same image but up here because the Windows computer is what's capturing um, the footage. And there we go. So this is the screen I play on, but then this screen is running the Windows computer and I'm running the Elgato Game Capture software, which shows that I'm capturing the, the thing. So um, there's a few different things you can play around with in here, um, but basically, for the most part, I leave it somewhere between better and best because uh, whenever, you, whenever you bring the quality up any further, you really aren't going to notice a difference, especially because YouTube is going to recompress it, so it doesn't matter. You can also turn 60 frames per second on or off. Uh, I currently have it off because Fallout 4 on Xbox One only runs at 30 frames a second, unfortunately. But um, there's a lot of different stuff you can do in here. You can even make particular profiles, so um, if you're doing it one thing over another, you can just quickly switch a bunch of settings at once. So um, I'm just going to uh, name the game. Fallout 4, and the video title is going to be uh, episode 163, because that's the episode I'm about to record. And then everything is all set up for the Elgato side. Whenever I hit the record button, it's going to start recording whatever I see. And the advantage of having two monitors like this is that I can look up and make sure that everything is okay. If anything goes wrong, if the software crashes, or if Windows crashes, something like that, then I can be alerted because it's you know still kind of in my peripheral vision. So that's that side of it. Um, we have the the game capture done. Now we have to do the audio. So my thing is on. It's all connected to my Mac. Um, over here on my Mac, I'm going to open GarageBand. And uh, I like GarageBand because it's very very powerful and it's very very easy to use and it's free if you have a Mac. If you don't have a Mac, you can't use GarageBand. You have to use uh, something for Windows. You're on your own for that one. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hit New, Empty Project, and it'll come up with a uh, classic electric piano, which I don't need, so I'll delete that track. 
and it'll ask me what kind of track I want to make. So by default, it's going to use input one of the Scarlet 18i8. So I hit create, and then I've got my first track. Now, you can see as I'm talking, this is bouncing up a little bit, and that's because I click these buttons, it'll, it'll actually show me the inputs. There are 18 inputs for the Scarlet 18i8, because 18 inputs, 8 outputs. So I can choose which input I want to use. Now, it's by default going to input 1, which is good, because the mic preamps on the front of that audio interface are 1, 2, 3, 4. So I'm going to choose one because that's this mic, and then that is all set up. I can rename the track, and I'm just going to call it Steven because that's who I am. Then I'm going to double click right here, and it makes a new track. Now by default, since this one was one, this one will become two, and I don't need that to be two because that's Mallory's mic. What I want instead is for it to be the game's audio. Now earlier I plugged that into ports five and six, which means... When I click this and this and go back to my inputs, I can choose five, and you hit this little button to turn it from mono to stereo, so it does both, and then it says five and six. So right now, I've got two tracks. This is my audio track, and this is my personal commentary, and then this is all of the game's audio, and that's what keeps things in perfect sync. Now, you don't have to do it this way, and if you don't have an audio interface and have no way to to rig it up where you can do that, that's okay. You can still do the tick, tick, tick. But if you have an audio interface, then you're cheating yourself if you don't set it up like this. You really should, because your stuff's always in perfect sync. So I'm gonna rename this game. So now what happens is whenever I start moving the, uh, the cursor here, um, it's making noise, which is reflected both on the Windows side because the game audio starts jumping up, and it's also reflected on the Mac side right here because the audio is, is being heard. Now the only other thing I have to do to set this up is I right click on one of these tracks in GarageBand and turn on Show Record Enable. And that allows me to record two tracks simultaneously. As far as I know, there's no track limit in GarageBand for recording simultaneously. This is the same way we did it with, uh, with Super Mario 3D World. We recorded four tracks for each of the four mics, and also the game audio. So we were recording five tracks simultaneously. Never had any problems, seemed to be fine. So this is all set up now. I'm gonna turn off the metronome because we don't need that. And then I'm gonna save this as Fallout 4 163. And we're good. At this point, all I have to do is hit record here, record here, and I'm recording the game and the audio through the Elgato, and I'm recording my audio through GarageBand and then we will take it into post. But for now, I have to record an episode. <laughs> no more cams. All right, Strong, where are you? And did you love it? Did you thoroughly enjoy watching me pull the addiction out of a woman with my char charismatic powers? Actually, where are you? Oh God, you're not even here. Someone is on the roof, though. Um, well, that's good. We needed that roof repaired. And done. All right. So I just finished recording Fallout, um, so I'm going to save, because I want, <laughs> want to make sure that I do that. Um, you'll notice that I was using a stopwatch to keep track of um, how much time has, has passed. I tried to shoot for about 40 minutes, somewhere between 35 and 40 minutes. So um, like if I'm you know teleporting or doing stuff off screen, I can stop the timer. I just use my, my phone for that. So now that I've saved the game, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. So that stops, and I'm going to stop the recording over here, so that stops. I'm going to go ahead and hit Command S, so that saves that, and then this is now um, exporting out the video. With the way the Elgato does it, um, it's recording normal video files, TS files, uh, but you have an option, if you want, to convert it to an MP4 when you're done. Um, I found that Final Cut will not even bother with these TS files, and it wants an MP4, so that's the reason I do it. So, it exports this out, it does it fairly quickly, and when it's done, I'll get to bring it over to the Mac side. Alright, so now that this is done, the MP4 has been created. Uh, I'm done with the Xbox, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it off. And I usually use this screen as my main screen for my Mac. So all I'm going to do is unplug the HDMI cable from the Elgato and re-plug in the cable for 
my Mac. So then this goes back to being my primary desktop. Um, I already saved the audio, so I could just go ahead and quit this. And then all I'm going to do is connect to the um, Windows computer and grab the file, which is called Fallout 4 Episode 163. And then I'm going to make a folder on my Mac, Fallout 4 163. And I'm going to drop it over. Um, one of the nice things for Macs and Windows, uh, Apple, Apple computers and Windows computers talking to each other is that on the Mac, I can see all the files on my Windows computer and grab them. So I can record something, um, you know, like an episode of Fallout, and then I'm done with the Windows side. I can go back to using um, Mac. Now, obviously, this setup is pretty unique in having two computers, most people have one, and that's usually fine. It's not particularly intensive, especially when using something like the Elgato, where most of the operation is happening in the device itself. It offloads a lot of that process. It would be very different if you were doing, um, for, uh, for example, um, like screen capture. Like if you were using something like Shadowplay, or you were using um, one of the other many different things, then it's a little more CPU intensive. But if you're using something like an Elgato, a capture device, it's nice. It, it takes a lot of the, the load off. Almost and done. All right, so now the Fallout episode that we just recorded, which was recorded using the Elgato on Windows, is now on Mac. Um, now, just in case there's been any confusion, that piece of hardware, the Elgato, both the Game Capture HD and the HD60, will work fine on Mac. So if you only have a Windows or you only have a Mac, that's fine. Both of these things will work on one or the other, so don't sweat it. Uh, now that I have this on here, I'm going to go ahead and close uh, this program and just shut down the Windows computer because, to be honest, I don't need it now. And I'm going to turn my attention over to the Mac side. Now, um, I edit everything in Final Cut Pro 10. I've been using Final Cut Pro for a long, long time, but you can use whatever you like. Most modern day editors support you know, a very wide variety of um, file types, especially MP4, so you can export out an MP4 from the Elgato software and your you know, editor will be able to, to do it just fine. So I'm gonna open up Final Cut Pro 10 here and then I'll show you um, how I have things organized. And I'm not gonna show you exactly how I edit something, that's for another video, um, but I'll show you exactly uh, how uh, I get a project started. So I've got, um, I have two different libraries in Final Cut, one for Steven Vlog and one for Steven Plays, and I have a third one for other, for just various things. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and open up uh, the Steven Plays library, and inside the library are events, and I just give all of my, uh, the games that I'm working on, events. So Fallout 4 has its own event. And inside of the Fallout 4 event are projects, and those are the individual episodes. So if we click this, it'll load up the most recent episode of Fallout 4, which was episode 162. And that's episode 162, and this is the timeline for it. So whenever I want to set up um, a new project, uh, I just go in here and give it you know, the same style name, Fallout 4, this is going to be 163. And then I open up my, uh, my finder window, and I go to the footage I just brought over from the Windows computer, and I drop it in the timeline. And then I go get the audio I recorded, which is recorded to the uh, music directory, but you can change the directories to whatever you want. And uh, GarageBand gives you these .band files, but if you right-click them and hit Show Package Contents and go to the Media folder, you'll find that you have just normal audio files inside, AIFs. That's what I grab, because that makes the most sense to me. So then I just grab and drag these down here. And uh, once again, this is where the beauty of recording the game's audio through the audio inter interface is going to come in, because everything will be perfectly synced for you. So you can see that I got the uh, the video and audio of the game right here. This is the audio recording from the game from the audio interface, and then this is my commentary. So I'm going to drag my commentary over here so everything is mostly lined up, get rid of the slug over here, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in so I can see the individual waveforms, and that will help me quickly line up 
uh, both game audios because what I want to do is I want my commentary to be perfectly in sync with exactly what I was playing at the time. So I'm going to come over here and cut off the beginning of this and drag it so these two um, audio uh, waveforms are the same. Drag this over a little bit, zoom in a little bit further, drag this over a little bit, and that's it. <laughs> now these match, which means that the entire thing is in sync. So I can now mute the uh, the audio that I was getting from the audio interface, so I just keep the, the, the pure clean audio from the HD, HDMI connection. And now my commentary is going to be perfectly in sync with the video. And that's it. There's no none of this like tick 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 stuff. Like if you have to do that, then that works fine. But this is just so much quicker and faster, which is really nice. Now as far as uh, the preset I use on my voice, if you use an audio interface, one of the things you'll quickly notice is that when you record, it looks like your waveforms are super low. But that's okay, because the advantage of using an audio interface is that the amount of room that you have is huge. You can record at 50% like we do, and even though it looks like your, your waveforms are just tiny, 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 that's because they're actually, the amount of space you have to play with is gigantic. You can scream into these mics, and you won't peak. You will not become distorted. And it's really cool. So what you do is when you bring it into your, your editing program, you can just bring up the audio and you sound great. So I have a, um, I have a preset that I've made myself uh, called Steven Solo, and it's what I put on my solo projects. And I just drag this onto my audio track and then everything is exactly how it should sound for me. Um, as far as what goes into this specific thing, it's kind of hard to explain, but just a general rundown is gain. You have to like dramatically boost the volume. There is a uh, an EQ because what it's really doing is kind of pumping up the bass of my voice a little bit. So that's what that does. There's also a compressor, and what the compressor does is it takes it takes the the lows of your volume whenever you're just kind of talking in a in a low voice, and it brings them up and it puts a ceiling on the higher parts. So it takes your, your big dynamic range of volume and kind of squishes it into something that sounds um, roughly the same volume, which I find is very, very helpful. And then the final thing is a noise gate. And what the noise gate does is it says, if you ever fall below a particular audio level, a particular decibel level, then just cut completely. And this is useful if you're recording something and you know you have maybe just a little bit of background noise then you can put the noise gate on and that background noise will be gone because it will only be when you're talking i find that very helpful that's basically what that preset is and then i just find where the episode begins which i believe is right here cut off the beginning and that's that's about it. I have to edit through and make sure everything's fine. I get to adjust, you know, audio levels. But that's basically how I, I start uh, an episode of Fallout 4. I'll go to the previous one and copy and paste over um, the uh, intro, because I have a little M-rated intro to let people know that, hey, your seven-year-old probably shouldn't watch this. And then I also have an intro that shows the episode number. And I can just change that to be episode 163. And then we're more or less off to the races. Um, for Fallout 4 specifically, uh, basically what I have to do is I, I have to watch through the episode and then tweak the audio because I want to make sure when I'm just kind of playing the game, the audio is a little bit lower. But whenever there's dialogue between the characters and I stop talking, I want to bring their audio levels up. And that's, that's that part. So I'm going to take uh, a few minutes and edit through this, and then whenever I'm done, we'll show you how it's packaged and sent off to YouTube land. Yes, that's it. Go and talk to them. All right, um, the is here, and we've been there before. Is that it? Okay, the number four is going to be talking about that. It's like scary or something. Uh, we're going to talk. Hey, 
All right, so I'm just now finishing up this episode of uh, Fallout, and at the end of the Fallout episodes, there's um, a segment where it shows uh, fan art that people have created. And uh, basically, I set that all up once, and then I've just been copying and pasting it for 160-something episodes. So I have, a, uh, I have a directory of all of the fan art that's been used, and then all of the fan art that um, has been submitted. And as people submit it on you know, Twitter, um, I just grab it and organize it here so I know who sent it and when they sent it, so I know, you know how old something is. So for this episode, we're going to be using um, this one, which I find really funny. It's uh, that meme that's been going around, but it's been adapted for Fallout and Grit Jones. So I'm going to just drag it in here, place this from start, which brings it into the timeline. And then I'm going to give it the same attributes that the previous one had, so it goes and fits in the right spot. And then I'm going to just change the name of the submitter, Werewolf Games uh, for you. And that matches the file name that I have right here. And then I just double check it, please, Fallout 4. And it looks like it's working just fine. Alright. So that episode is done. Uh, it's 41 minutes long. Fallout is by far the most time-consuming series I've ever put together on the channel. They take forever to record. They take forever to edit. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of effort to make an episode of Fallout. Uh, so now I have this all set. That's the, the finished timeline. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit send a compressor. Um, depending on what NLE you're using, whatever editing program, it might be different. Um, for Final Cut, you can export stuff right out of Final Cut, but there's a um, another program that goes along with it called Compressor, and you can basically send your completed timelines to Compressor, give it certain um, attributes for exporting, and then you're done with it and you don't have to touch it. And uh, I find that it's actually a little more powerful than Final Cut in some ways. So I have a, a custom export setting for uh, Steven Place content. So I just drag that on there. I hit start batch. And then it shows me a little uh, meter here with uh, how long it's going to take. And most Fallout episodes take like eh, 10 to 15 minutes to export. So in about 10 minutes, this will be ready and done. All right, it took, uh, it looks like nine minutes and 24 seconds. We can go over to the completed tab and see the progress. And that means that our our file itself is ready. So if we go over here to the dump, uh, here is our completed video, standing at uh, 4.7 gigs, uh, Fallout 4, episode 163. There it is, it's all done. Now I'm sure someone's gonna be interested in knowing what export settings I use, um, as if there's some like magical formula to make it work. Uh, there's really not. Um, depending on what you're using to export, whether you're using a program like Compressor or Adobe, Adobe Media Encoder, or if you're just exporting directly from your, your NLE, um, the only thing you really need to know is that you need to be exporting an H.264 file, because that is what YouTube and the rest of the internet uses. Um, and you need to keep in mind the data rate that you're going to export with. For gaming content, we use 15 megabits per second. If your uh, exporting program uses kilobits, that would be the equivalent of 15,000. So 15,000 kilobits per second is the data rate we use to export gaming content. I've played around with a bunch of numbers and I found that that tends to look the best and also not be unnecessarily high. Because you can make it as high as you want. You can make it 100,000. But the problem is, you've only recorded it at a particular data rate in the first place. So you can't make footage look better than it was recorded at. That's not how it works. And then also you have to consider when you put it up onto YouTube, YouTube is compressing it itself anyway. So I found that 15,000 kilobits per second works really good. Uh, we use that for gaming content. We use 10,000 for vlog content just because with the way the compression algorithms work um, on H.264, it's, you need a slightly higher data rate for gaming content. Because, for example, when you're playing a first-person shooter and you're moving around, all the different pixels from frame to frame are changing. But if you're doing, you know, vlog content and you're filming yourself, 
a lot of the pixels from frame to frame are actually staying the same, so the compression and the data rate can be a little bit lower. Anyway, oh, and if you're using 4K, 40,000. That's the magic number. Um, so yeah, as long as you do H.264 and you do 15,000 kilobits per second, the other stuff doesn't really matter. Set your audio to AAC and, and you're done. So now that this is all finished up, that's it. We go over to YouTube, we hit upload, and then you just gotta fill in a few a few forms. And that's that's it. That was an extremely long video and may have contained more information than you needed, but hopefully it helped in some way. That's the most up-to-date thing we've made in years, and it explained hopefully all of the equipment that we use um, and all of the you know the, the process it takes to create a, a Let's Play episode from start to finish. Uh, as before, all of the links to all of the different things are down in the description. The only other things I can quickly think to mention that I, I may have forgotten is, um, if you do go the you know, the budget route and you just buy something like this, like the Sennheiser PC-151, uh, keep in mind that if, you, if you're doing a Let's Play, you're hooking it up into your, your microphone jack of your computer, you can do two-player Let's Plays the same way. Buy two of these and buy a... Uh, three and a half millimeter splitter, so kind of the same thing you would use for you and a friend to listen to a song on your iPod on the airplane. Um, same thing, plug this end into your computer and your headsets into this, and then you can record two people onto one audio track on your computer. You could even split it multiple times and do four player recordings. Now keep in mind, you're recording one audio track, so if you do it this way, you're not gonna be able to make someone you know, louder or softer. You can still kind of play around with it with audio settings, but like, for example, if your friend sneezes while you're talking and saying something important, you can't cut out that sneeze. So that's one of the downsides of doing it this way. But on the cheap, it's a pretty good option. The other thing I forgot to mention, which is um, relatively important, is that um, whenever you're, you're capturing footage with uh, any sort of game capture device, the, uh, the light levels in which it captures the gamma may be a little bit off, so just keep in mind that whenever you bring your footage into your editing program, um, you may want to take a look at the uh, the color board and adjust, you know, your shadows and your highlights because they could be a little off. So for example, um, when your footage gets into the the editing software, it might be that it's a little too dark, and you have to bump up, you know, the lighting just a little bit. And there's actually a graph that you can use. Um, uh, they call them scopes, but that's honestly a, a completely different video, and we'll talk about that some other time. Um, anyway, hopefully you, you learned something. Like I said before, the links to all of the stuff that we use will be down in the description box below if you're interested in getting something. If you have a question, please ask. Um, I will be looking at the comments and answering the questions. If you have anything specific, um, then I, I'll take a look at it and see what your question is. Hopefully this has helped some of you. We've had questions about, you know, not only our equipment, but the way that we do things for years. And this is the most updated thing that I could, uh, that I could tell you. Um, we, we put the headphones on, they're connected to the audio interface, we talk into the microphones, all of that's recorded to a computer, we capture the video game uh, console with this device. If it's a retro console, we use the older version of the Elgato. That's recorded. And we bring both things into the editing software, we sync it, and we edit it. And that's, that's how it's done. Um, now if you have another specific tutorial that you'd like to see in the future, please let me know that as well. Whether it's related to Let's Plays and the gaming channel, or if you'd like to see how a vlog is created, or the editing process, or anything like that. Um, let me know what you want to see. I know it's been a long time since we've done these sorts of videos, but Obviously, there's people that are interested in them, and I'd like to meet that uh, that market for, for those who are interested in seeing that. So let me know, and we'll, uh, we'll make future videos about that. All right. Long vlog. Hope you learned something. Thanks for watching. And as always, let's meet back tomorrow, shall we?